a really extraordinary group of people who have been totally fundamental and instrumental in building out an impact and evaluation framework. These are the people that add insight, veracity, new ways of thinking and working. These are the people that define what the change platform looks like. And there is still an argument to be made for many of our foundations and for not-for-profits why, why these sorts of skill sets can make such an extraordinary um, contribution to the change agenda. So with that, my friend at the back of the room, can we introduce Chris now to the screen? So Chris Marmo, I don't know if many of you know of Paper Giants, but Paper Giants is an extraordinary organisation that works using design thinking principles and deep expertise about connecting often with those with lived experience to capture insights, stories, narratives that define the context in which we might think about how we think about building the platforms for change. Um, I first met Chris, I probably drive Chris mad, I don't know if you can hear me, are you there Chris? I probably drive Chris mad because I often ring him with really tricky questions. But Chris did a really important piece of work for the Menzies Foundation around our science entrepreneurship initiative, where he worked directly with science entrepreneurs to codify and understand why Australia was struggling to commercialise our outstanding science. And I've asked Chris to come here today to share with you about when you're thinking about impact, when you're thinking about evaluating for impact, when you're thinking about the change that you want to make in the world, why someone with Chris's expertise, with the sort of work that Chris's organisation does, can give you an amazing insight into the base from which you ought to start building that opportunity. So, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Liz. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I can hear myself a little bit uh, echoing back, but um, uh, Liz, I love your phone calls, first of all. You can call me anytime. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm coming to you from Melbourne today, um, from the spot that I spent most of uh, the last couple of years um, working um, on projects like this one um, through through various uh, numerous lockdowns. Um, this is a new experience for me, though. I haven't ever presented uh, to a room of people that I can't really see. So um, I don't know if the clicks will come through um, very clearly or not, but I, I trust that Liz will um, let me know what I need to know about the audience uh, there. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you about this concept of due, due diligence and really to provide an example of what it means uh, to do due diligence when we're uh, working towards um, outcomes, not outputs, um, as Catherine has um, talked about um, really well, um, using, using tools like systems mapping and, and uh, engagement with lived experience. Um, so just before I do that, um, Paper Giant um, is a strategic, we call ourselves a strategic design consultancy. We work across the research design and strategy spectrum. Um, you can check out our website if you're interested in um, learning more, but we, we have worked with the Menzies Foundation on, on a number of um, initiatives. And uh, even currently, I think we're working on um, a project with the Northern Rivers Community Foundation, which has been funded by the Ramsey Foundation. So um, we have some experience of um, sort of working with your sector um, and, and working towards um, this goal of, of uh, outcomes, not just outputs. Um, so I want to spend sort of 10 to 15 minutes just uh, exploring this question uh, with you all and, and using the example of um, the collaboration that we um, uh, we worked on with Liz um, to, you know, to highlight that. So. The question that I'm interested in exploring with you is like, what is due diligence? Um, and what, particularly, what, it, what does it mean to do due, due diligence when what you're aiming for is systems change? Um, the example um, that I'll use through um, the next um, uh, couple of minutes is um, a project which I believe is still publicly available, Liz. Maybe you can confirm that uh, later on. But um, the, the project was titled The Experience of Science Entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, we, we conducted systems research into science entrepreneurship, um, focusing on the lived experience of, of scientists who have attempted um, or aim to attempt to commercialise the research. Um, just a little bit of context on the project before I dive into this, this exploring this question um, around due diligence. Um, our, our goal in the project with Liz was to help create um, essentially more startups founded on science innovation. Um, this uh, diagram on the right here um, 
uh, sort of depicts a, a positive feedback loop of science commercialization. This is uh, a, what we call a systems diagram. I won't sort of give too much of a um, sort of tutorial on how to read this, but uh, we understood with Liz that um, in order to grow um, the overall pipeline of science entrepreneurship and in increase uh, the outcome that we cared about, which is for Australia to get better at commercializing research, um, we wanted to focus on the very, very beginning of, of that feedback loop, which was to uh, encourage more scientists to attempt to commercialize their research. So that's what this diagram is depicting. Um, so that's the, the wider context of the, the collaboration between Paper Giant and, and the Menzies Foundation. But back to this question, um, what is due diligence in systems change? Um, this is the answer on the page. So if you want to take a photo or something, this is this is the one. Um, there's, there's three aspects to due diligence um, from Paper Giant's perspective. Um, um, that is, you know, un first understanding the problem um, or the problems. Um, once you do that, then finding the right leverage points within that problem, um, and then creating tools to help uh, decision making over various time horizons. So I'll speak to each one of these in turn now. So the first one, understanding the problem, the first aspect of due diligence and systems change. Um, so using uh, using the methods that we use, design research, um, ethnography, and, and kind of systems mapping, um, we tend to begin all problem exploration by engaging with the lived experience um, of those that we are problem solving for. Um, hearing um, Catherine just talk about um, you know, deep listening and, and engagement and, and the, the concept of designing with um, is, is core to the, uh, the approach of engaging with lived experience, um, no matter the context or sector that you're, you're hoping to sort of work with. Um, and so in the context of this project, um, engaging with lived experience meant um, spending time with and interviewing um, science entrepreneurs um, of different stripes and varieties um, to understand that they, the journeys that they had experienced in first coming up with the discoveries uh, and, and moving through the commercialization uh, journey. Um, we also interviewed um, a number of actors in, in the wider ecosystem to um, understand how, um, how they work individually, but how they collaborate um, across those organizational silos. So working with the silos um, and trying to understand how, how people are navigating them currently. Um, and, and of course, working with gov uh, interviewing government uh, actors as well. So various departments, um, DISA um, through to um, organize government organizations like Data61 or, or CSIRO to understand how they view science commercialization as well. Um, and what we did was uh, we mapped what we call the first person perspective um, through this complex system of actors, policies and processes um, so that we could identify the key leverage points for Liz and her partners. Um, so I, I believe we, we interviewed probably about 30 um, uh, scientists who are thinking about commercializing their research or have done that um, to various degrees of success as well. Um, and we synthesized a lot of that um, that understanding into um, what we call a, a journey map, um, which which depicts the common stages of the entrepreneurship or science commercialization journey. Um, the stages themselves are interesting, um, but it, that's kind of not the point here. I guess we you know we 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 what we're doing here is sort of leveraging up from conversations and understanding of the lived experience to create a representation of what actually happens and what people what people move through. So in the case of science uh, commercialization, coming up with the initial science discovery, um, incubating um, a startup, uh, or incubating the, the, the possibility of a, a startup, spinning that out from the host organization like CSIRO or, or others, commercializing that and then scaling it up. Um, and, and another thing that we found through, through the research, not only just you know, understanding the common journeys that people are moving through, but understanding the different types of motivations and drivers that, that uh, different types of science entrepreneurs had. Um, Liz um, spoke, spoke to a really great archetype tool for um, not-for-profits and philanthropy organizations in her opening um, address. Um, we also uh, learned enough to create archetypes of science entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, again, there's, there's a lot of detail in, in the report, which I believe is public, but um, we found that there are three main um, types of science entrepreneurs, uh, discoverers, translators, and visionaries. They're all driven by slightly different things, 
um, and they experienced the journey um, of science commercialization in, in different and, and meaningfully different ways. Um, and so an example of that uh, uh, for uh, the archetype that we uh, named a discoverer. Um, so this is an example of how a discoverer experienced um, the journey of commercializing um, some of their science discoveries. Um, so this type of entrepreneur is motivated primarily by the thrill of their discovery. So they're, they're classic kind of, they're, they're passionate scientists and they, they're, they're driven by, by making novel discoveries. Um, and so we found through engaging with the lived experience of people that were like this, that when it came to you know, facing problems like IP negotiations or, or other um, commercial, um, you know, commercial or financial issues, um, they were more likely to go back to their science work because that's what they were passionate about. They, they weren't necessarily passionate about the business side. Um, compare that to a different type of archetype, which was uh, we called a translator. But this person was absolutely motivated uh, around the, the science discovery, but more so about making that discovery available um, to the world and having an impact through that discovery. And so that person was more likely to persist through various challenges it's not to say that there were problems for that person as well, but they, you can kind of start to see how the experience of the journey was more nuanced uh, than, we, than we understood before we engaged with that lived experience. Um, once we did that comparative analysis, we were then able to identify the common um, and highest impact problems that we might want to solve um, across all science entrepreneurs and all, experience of, all experiences of commercialization. Um, so here's just three three examples of some high impact problems that we we identified with Liz. Um, so obviously a, a big one around encouraging more scientists to, to commercialize. Um, these are complex diagrams. So I, I won't explain them in, in great detail. But that first problem is um, highlighting how science uh, scientists perceive risk um, of commercialization was a major um, factor in stopping them. Chris, uh, progressing. Chris, Chris got two minutes left. Okay. Two minute bell. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, commercialization, knowledge of mentorship, and then uh, intellectual property negotiation. So the problems are interesting um, in and of themselves. But the, the key point that I want to make here is that engaging with lived experience gives us a deep understanding of the problems people face so that we know what problems are possible to solve. Not all of these problems are solvable by, you know, certainly not by every single actor, but you have that representation by engaging with them. Um, very quickly, finding the right leverage point. So let's zoom into um, one of these diagrams a bit more um, carefully. So I mentioned the perceived risk um, was a major barrier to, to many different types of science entrepreneurs getting started. Um, we found four sort of leverage points that feed into that perception. Um, and through co uh, essential co-design uh, workshops with, with Liz and her partners, um, we were able to help identify one leverage point that we wanted to make the biggest difference in, which was um, helping create known pathways back from failure, which people were really um, worried about. They were giving up often very long-lived careers in, in big organisations to, to take a risk. Uh, they wanted to know that they could come back if it didn't work out. Um, once you understand that, you can create sort of platforms for co-design through questions like this, like how might we create those pathways or how we, might we make them more visible? And um, so the key point here is that due diligence means helping partners identify where, how, and with whom they want to intervene and make strategic decisions around that. Um, very last point, this is really quick, Liz, um, but creating decision-making tools. So this is the third aspect of doing due diligence. Um, we put a lot of effort into doing this, this research and, and design work well. Um, and a part of what we think doing that well means is to create tools that can be reused for different types of decisions um, later on. We had um, particular priorities and uh, identified particular leverage points in this project, but we put um, quite a lot of effort into making these systems maps and reports available to um, the wider ecosystem of actors so that they could uh, make their own decisions about how they wanted to intervene and, and contribute to the systems change um, that is necessary. Um, so the last point, due diligence means designing tools that capture the long tail value of your work uh, and making that available to people where possible um, so that you can support ongoing decision making, not just for yourself, but through the ecosystem itself. Um, thanks. All right. So uh, I'm sorry that we had to finish that, but we're running out of time. The point I wanted to make... 
the point I wanted to make about Chris's thing is that we, the, I, I had a tussle at my board to get that project funded uh, because I needed that project to, to let the board understand the dimensions of the problem we were dealing with and what the narrative was and how, to, how the Menzies Foundation might think about framing or responding to that problem. So th the, we presented that project to the board as a project for the system, as a way of understanding the system. But actually the power of that project, the power of that grant to fund that Paper Giants project was in building a common language and understanding of what the problem is we're trying to solve between the board and the people working on the ground. But also to provide the foundation for all the other subsequent collaboration partners that we had. We had a narrative that described the system. We had an evidence base based on lived experience that articulated the problem. We could explain why we were responding in the way we were in the context of that. That's a much more powerful platform to operate from, to build collaborations and new relationships from. And the type of work that organisations like Paper Giants does can make an enormous contribution to how we're thinking about systemic challenges or you know, the sorts of issues that many people are dealing with in this room. 